is Torvald Franke and in this video I present my book about Aristotle and Atlantis. In this book I demonstrate that Aristotle was not against but in favor of the existence of Plato's Atlantis. So let us begin. Somebody who has read more than one book about Plato's Atlantis will surely have encountered the following sentence. He who invented Atlantis also destroyed it. Or, he who invented the island also sank it. Or similar. This sentence shows many variations throughout Atlantis literature. Allegedly, this sentence had been written by Aristotle. Aristotle was a direct disciple of Plato and next to Plato the most important philosopher of all times. So, if even Aristotle considered Atlantis an invention by Plato, then Atlantis may have been indeed an invention, so you think. Especially Atlantis skeptics use this sentence time and again, and they always say that Aristotle is the author of this sentence. Yet, is this really true? You immediately come into trouble if you only want to look up the sentence in order to see it, its exact wording. When searching the sentence in the available works of Aristotle, you will not find it. It simply does not occur there. The sentence can, instead, be found in the work of the geographer Strabo in the second book, in paragraph 3.6. Strabo lived 300 years after Aristotle. To be precise, our wanted sentence is a subordinate clause. A subordinate clause written in connection with the opinion of the Stoic polymath Poseidonius about Plato's Atlantis. Poseidonius rejects the statement of inventing Atlantis and then making it disappear again. And only because the geographer Strabo writes about this rejection of Poseidonius, only because of that we know this statement of inventing Atlantis and then making it disappear again. The original passage is as follows. That the story about the island of Atlantis is not a fiction. And Poseidonius thinks that it is better to put the matter in that way than to say of Atlantis, its inventor caused it to disappear, just as did the poet the wall of the Achaeans. At least, we know now the exact wording of the statement. So Poseidonius rejects the thesis of our statement, because Poseidonius says in this passage that it is better to assume the existence of Atlantis than to believe in the statement of inventing Atlantis and then making it disappear again. Something else is absolutely disappointing in this exact wording. The author of the subordinate clause with the statement of inventing Atlantis and then making it disappear again is not mentioned. Allegedly, it is said to be Aristotle, but this is not written here. Thus, the author of the subordinate clause concerning the invention of Atlantis is, for the moment, an unknown person. But how do some conclude that this statement is from Aristotle? And what is this strange wall of the Achaeans? Well, in order to show the authorship of Aristotle, academics point to another passage in Strabo's work in the 13th book, in paragraph 1.36. In this passage, there is talk about Homer's Iliad, which is about the Trojan War, as everybody knows. There is especially talk about the wall which the Greeks had built around their ships at the beach of Troy. This wall around the Greek ships is shortly called the Wall of the Achaeans. In Strabo's other passage, we find the presumption that this wall of the Achaeans never existed, but was only an invention by Homer. 
The passage in its exact wording is as follows. Or perhaps no wall was built, and the erection and destruction of it, as Aristotle says, are due to the invention of the poet. Finally, here in the second passage, Aristotle is mentioned. So it is Aristotle's presumption that Homer invented the wall of the Achaeans, and that he later made it disappear with poetic liberty. Yet Aristotle says this only about the wall of the Achaeans. There is no talk at all about Atlantis in this passage. So far so good. But what does Aristotle's statements about the wall of the Achaeans have to do with Atlantis? Many academics obviously think that a synopsis of both passages alone would immediately show that the statement against the existence of Atlantis is from Aristotle, because they only give these two statements, these two strigo passages, as evidence. So let us again have a look at the first passage from Strabo's work. That the story about the island of Atlantis is not a fiction, and Poseidonius thinks that it is better to put the matter in that way than to say of Atlantis, its inventor caused it to disappear, just as did the poet the wall of the Achaeans. We know now that Aristotle said that Homer invented the wall of the Achaeans, and then made it disappear again. And somebody, whose name is not mentioned here, draws a comparison between Homer's account of the wall of the Achaeans on the one hand, of which Aristotle thought that Homer invented it, and Plato's account of Atlantis on the other hand. And above all, Poseidonius rejects this comparison. But how, whether who is the unknown person who draws the comparison? Is it necessarily Aristotle? Obviously, some believe that is necessarily, or at least likely, Aristotle, because they believe that they only have to point to the two passages in Strabo's works, and this would show everything. Yet, in truth, Aristotle is, of course, not necessarily the author of this statement. Not at all. The unknown person who draws the comparison between Plato's Atlantis and the wall of the Achaeans makes use of Aristotle's words about the wall of the Achaeans in order to make a statement about Plato's Atlantis. But that the unknown person makes use of a word of Aristotle does, of course, not at all mean that the unknown person himself is Aristotle. In the same way, not everybody who applies a word of Shakespeare to a certain situation is Shakespeare himself. This would really be a strange idea. So it is even unlikely that our sentence, our subordinate clause about the invention of Atlantis is from Aristotle. Furthermore, Strabo who likes citing Aristotle, even when he disagrees with Aristotle, always mentions Aristotle's name when he cites him. But here, Strabo does not mention Aristotle's name. Some academics add to the evidence they give for Aristotle's authorship a hint to a collection of fragments from the lost works of Aristotle. The passage in Strabo about Aristotle's opinion about inventing the wall of the Achaeans and then making it disappear again is indeed such a fragment from a lost work of Aristotle. It most probably is from the lost work Aporimata Homerica. It is fragment number 162 in the collection of Valentin Rose. But when looking up there, you only find the word 
about the wall of the Achaeans, but not the word about Atlantis. And thus, the hint to the collection of fragments provides again no evidence for Aristotle's authorship for the sentence of the invention of Atlantis. To give as evidence the two Strabo passages, or the hint to the collection of fragments, is simply an insufficient evidence. What academics provide as evidence concerning our question is frequently close to feigning evidence since it simply is no evidence. Let us note that the word against the existence of Atlantis had never been included in any collection of Aristotle's fragments. Also, numerous researchers on Plato think it is a word of Aristotle. This can only mean that the researchers on Aristotle do not consider the statement a word of Aristotle. Otherwise, the researchers on Aristotle had included the statement into their collections of fragments. Having done thus far, we have to pause. Until now, we have seen evidence, which is no evidence. And we already have seen a series of arguments why the statement against the existence of Atlantis is not a word of Aristotle. Maybe there is some academic who put forward an argument which can convince us. In order to find out, we have to analyze systematically which academics have raised the claim that there would be a word of Aristotle against the existence of Atlantis and how they justify their claim. As a result of this analysis, we made two observations. First that some scholars quietly express doubts whether it really is a word of Aristotle. For example, they add an uncertain in a footnote and leave it at that. Some academics seem to intentionally avoid the topic. They just stay completely silent about it. Well, this all is really somewhat strange. As a second observation, we found that practically no academic makes an attempt to explain how these two Strabo passages show that Aristotle is the author of the statement against the existence of Atlantis. Instead, always only, these two Strabo passages are given as uh, evidence, in quotation, without any further explanation. Sometimes a footnote points to another academic who uses the statement as an argument. Thus, one academic points to another academic from whom he got the idea. When tracing back this chain of references from academic to academic, from footnote to footnote, then we find that all these chains of references converge at the Frenchman Jean-Baptiste Joseph de Lombre. This de Lombre is the initial author of the claim that Aristotle allegedly is the author of the statement against the existence of Atlantis. Jean-Baptiste Joseph de Lombre was a famous astronomer. His name is engraved in gold letters on the Eiffel Tower in Paris, together with the names of 72 other famous French scientists. It was in the year 1816 when Delambre published his claim. Before Delambre, nobody ever had put forward this claim. Really, nobody. To the contrary. Until far into the 19th century, Aristotle was considered to be in favor of the existence of Atlantis. Beginning with Proclus in late antiquity, many authors put forward passages from the works of Aristotle as evidence for the existence of Atlantis, which and why we will see in the second half of this video. By this, we disproved just another widespread mistaken claim. It is the claim 
that in the Middle Ages allegedly nobody wrote about Atlantis because Aristotle, as the leading philosopher, spoke out against the existence of Atlantis. But none of this is true. Aristotle did not speak out against the existence of Atlantis. And in the Middle Ages there were many authors writing about Atlantis, as I demonstrated in my book about the history of Atlantis hypothesis in 2016. But how did Delambre come across the wrong idea? That Aristotle would be the author of the sentence against the existence of Atlantis. Delambre himself tells us. Allegedly, he had found this interpretation in the Latin commentary on Strabo's work, written in 1587 by the Renaissance humanist Isaac Casaubon. But if we look up there, we only find that the statement about the wall of the Achaeans is from Aristotle. Isaac Casaubon does not say in his commentary that also the statement against the existence of Atlantis would be from Aristotle. We only can guess that Delambre made a mistake, that Delambre probably misinterpreted a complex Latin sentence. Yet in any case it is crystal clear, Delambre made a mistake. And this mistake started to spread in 1816, until it finally became included into the leading academic lexicon Pauli's Real Encyclopedie in 1896. From this date, the mistake had become official science. In the 2000s, that is around 200 years after the Lombre, Professor Harold Tarrant, practically as the first scholar ever, put forward some vague presumptions why Aristotle could be the author of this sentence. Tarrant points to similarities of the words for invent and make disappear in both Strabo passages. Yet such similarities are not very meaningful, since similar vocabulary does not say too much. When two people say something similar independently of each other, then it frequently happens that they use similar words. What is more, these words do even not occur in the same grammatical form. Also concerning certain passages in the work of Proclus from late antiquity, Tarrant puts forward some speculations. But it really are only mere speculations, since he builds his argument on mere assumptions and uh, loose comparisons. For example, the word to invent is similar on the one hand side in Plato that Atlantis was not invented, and on the other hand side in Strabo, in the subordinate clause, that Atlant Atlantis was invented. But the word invent is used in affirmation in the one source and in negation in the other source, and this prevents us to see much similarities here. And then it is absolutely not clear where to draw the line in the Strabo passage between what Aristotle says and what Poseidonius and Strabo say. Maybe Aristotle indeed put the statement of inventing Atlantis and making it disappear again in his own words. But he did not stop there. Maybe he also added the rejection of this statement, as we have seen it with Poseidonius. As you can see, this all is very, very speculative. Furthermore, Tarrant has fallen for the wrong idea that already in antiquity Aristotle had been believed to speak out against the existence of Atlantis, yet this is definitely wrong. As we could demonstrate, before the year of 1816, nobody ever did believe this. The opposite was the case. Well, at this point, we can finalize the first big question of this video. And we can conclude 
the off-citing word against the existence of Atlantis is not from Aristotle. Nothing speaks in favor of this, favor of this assumption, and everything, really everything, speaks against it. We call the argumentation to this question in the first half of the video the explicit argumentation. Since it is about the question whether Aristotle explicitly spoke out against the existence of Plato's Atlantis. The second big question of this video, which will occupy us for the rest of the time, is the following. Is it possible to derive indirectly Aristotle's opinion about Plato's Atlantis from his other works and from the words and works of his disciples and successors? This is what we'll try now. We call this argumentation, which we do now, the implicit argumentation, since it is about implicit hints to the opinion of Aristotle. When looking around in the works of Aristotle, we find numerous statements which correspond to Plato's Atlantis story. For example, we find a number of statements about repeatedly occurring natural disasters and that the development of civilization starts anew after each natural disaster. Now, this is really the same idea as in Plato's Atlantis story. In the field of geography, Aristotle assumes, as did Plato, that the Earth is a sphere. Aristotle thinks that the sea route from Gibraltar to India around the globe cannot be too long. In this connection, Aristotle mentions as a reason for the proximity of Gibraltar and India that in the Far East, as well as in the Far West of the known world, of the known world in Aristotle's time, there live elephants. Ernst Hugo Berger, one of the luminaries in the field of ancient geography, clearly recognized what this means. Aristotle must have thought of a sunken land bridge between Gibraltar and India, because only then the existence of elephants in the Far East as well as in the Far West of the known world provides an explanation for the proximity of Gibraltar and India. Ernst Hugo Berger adds that Plato wrote that there were elephants in Atlantis too. So Atlantis as the sunken land bridge between Gibraltar and India. Thereby Ernst Hugo Berger had explicitly expressed what is hidden only implicitly in the statements of Aristotle, a confirmation of the existence of Plato's Atlantis. By the way, Ernst Hugo Berger had been the author of the lexicon article in Pauli's Real Encyclopedia from 1896, in which Atlantis was declared to be an invention. But in his other works, Berger shows himself much more open-minded towards the question of Atlantis. In the field of geology, Aristotle talks at large about the emergence of land from the sea and about the submergence of land into the sea, and this all in connection also with islands. There are many considerations in Aristotle's works about earthquakes and floods too. Certain similarities to Plato's Atlantis story cannot be overlooked, to say it cautiously. In the very same work in which Aristotle talks about geological phenomena, Aristotle also mentions the mud in the sea in front of Gibraltar. In these times, Everybody believed that there was mud in the sea in front of Gibraltar, which prevented seafaring. Yet Aristotle 
does not put forward any reason for the existence of this mud in front of Gibraltar. In this, in a geological work in which giving such reasons for such geological phenomena is the main topic. If Aristotle does not put forward any reason in this work, then Aristotle practically and automatically agrees with the one and only reason for the existence of this mud in front of Gibraltar, which was ever put forward in these times. And this is Plato's Atlantis. In his considerations on rhetoric and poetry, Aristotle expresses his opinion that no one ever had tried to write an epic in prose. An epic in prose. This exactly would be the Atlantis story if it was an invention. Some academics view the Atlantis story indeed as an epic in prose by which Plato wanted to triumph over Homer. But Aristotle says now that no one ever had tried to write an epic in prose. Thus, Aristotle said implicitly that the Atlantis story is not an epic, and therefore it may well not be an invention. Also in the field of politics we find many correspondences with the Atlantis story. But we leave it at that now, in order to come to the last and very interesting question. This is the question what Aristotle's disciples and successors thought about Plato's Atlantis, especially Theophrastus and Posidonius. Theophrastus was the direct successor of Aristotle as the head of the school of philosophy founded by Aristotle. There is a fragment from the lost works of Theophrastus handed down to us by Philo of Alexandria. In this fragment there is explicit talk of Atlantis as a real place. Some academics have speculated whether this passage on Atlantis is not really from Theophrastus, but was maybe inserted later into the text. Because they simply could not believe it. Because they assumed that Aristotle spoke out explicitly against the existence of Atlantis in Strabo, and Aristotle was the teacher of Theophrastus. Here we can see how one mistake can produce the next mistake. Science comes into real dangers when sticking to mistakes. Fortunately, these speculating academics were honest, and they openly admitted that they have no real reasons to underpin their speculations. This they want to praise expressly on this occasion. This honesty is truly academic. This is true science. Well, since there are no reasons left to doubt the authenticity of the fragment, we are obliged to assume that it is a real fragment from the lost work of Theophrastus. And this means that a direct successor of Aristotle considered Atlantis a real place. The Stoic philosopher and polymath Poseidonius is known to be a loyal follower, follower of Aristotle's teachings concerning geography. We already have seen his opinion about Plato's Atlantis at the beginning of this video. Poseidonius cites, as we have seen, the comparison between Atlantis and the invention of the Wall of the Achaeans in order to reject this comparison. On the one hand side, there remains some uncertainty for Posadonius, yet he is clearly inclined to believe in the existence of Atlantis. If Posidonius, who is known to be a close uh, um, to the geographical views of Aristotle, had had a totally different view 
than had Aristotle, then Posidonius surely would have discussed this, but he does not do it. Posidonius seems to be in full harmony with Aristotle in this question. And this suggests that Aristotle had no other opinion than Posidonius. Let us make a short summary of the implicit argumentation. Aristotle nowhere contradicts the Atlantis story. In many details and elements we found even correspondences and agreement. In a few passages it almost seemed certain that Aristotle supports the existence of Atlantis and the disciples and successors of Aristotle spoke out explicitly in favor of the existence of Atlantis. Therefore, it is no surprise that from antiquity until far into the 19th century, that is, until Delambre's mistake prevailed, numerous authors relied on passages in Aristotle's works in order to speak out in favor of the existence of Atlantis. Thus, we have reached the final summary of the whole video. We know now that the alleged word of Aristotle against the existence of Atlantis is not a word of Aristotle. And we know now that Aristotle, to the contrary, with all probability, was in favor of the existence of Atlantis. This means that academic scholarship is caught in a collective error in this question and this since the 19th century. This is also the reason why several academics express their doubts only shortly in footnotes or even avoid the question completely. They realized that there is a problem with the prevailing opinion, but they want to avoid troubles by not confronting it. The best approximation of the thoughts of Aristotle about Plato's Atlantis may well be the statement by Posidonius, as handed down to us by Strabo. This means he has no absolute certainty about the existence of Atlantis, yet he is clearly inclined to believe in the existence of Atlantis. Therefore, at the end of this video, we want to read the words about Posidonius' opinion as a description of Aristotle's opinion. That the story about the island of Atlantis is not a fiction. And he thinks that it is better to put the matter in that way than to say of Atlantis, its inventor caused it to disappear, just as did the poet the wall of the Achaeans. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of this book presentation. I hope I could help you to make progress in your own thoughts about Plato's Atlantis.